Great news for all chess fans, as Magnus Carlsen is playing a new over-the-board tournament uh, right now. A big tournament in Germany started the Granke Chess Classic, and uh, it's a six-players round-robin tournament. And apart from Magnus, also the current world champion, Ding Liren, is uh, participating. So it will be very interesting to see Magnus playing against the world champion. Now, it's the first day, round one, and uh, we are going to check out the game of the second of um, Ding Li Ren, Richard Rapport from uh, Hungary, playing with the uh, white pieces against Magnus Carlsen. And some very dramatic things are happening in this uh, game. Now, it's very interesting to uh, check out this game. But before, I should say that it's not just a normal uh, round robin tournament because the players are playing two games per day. Uh, it's uh, 10 rounds in total. And as you can uh, see, uh, it's a shorter time control. So it's what we call sort of modern classical uh, time control, 45 minutes plus 10 seconds increment. So it's sort of a hybrid system between um, classical and faster uh, time uh, control chess. So let's have a look at this game. If you are interested in seeing more fascinating games, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Here we go as Richard Rapport goes for the move 1e4. And we have a Karokan. Maybe a bit of a surprise, it's not one of the main weapons of uh, Magnus, but nowadays all top players, they are playing different opening systems, so not a big surprise. And after d4, d5, uh, Rapport plays the advanced variation. It's actually considered to be the critical system nowadays. Grabbing space, it's uh, making it easier for White to uh, shuffle around with its pieces. So Bishop f5 and White goes h4. Very aggressive move. Grabbing space on the king side, and if you're careless with a move like e6, then white can follow up with uh, g4. So the bishop gets in uh, trouble on f5. Therefore, h5 is the main move to secure the bishop on f5. Uh, but at the same time, this pawn on h5 can also turn out to be a, a weakening move. Let's see how it goes. Bishop d3, bishop takes, queen takes, bishops um, are off the board now. And here, queen a5, check is played. And White has different ways of handling this uh, check. Rapport played here the move c3. Flexible move. You could also have gone for other uh, ways of uh, solving the check, for instance by uh, interfering with the bishop or the knight on uh, d2. But with the move c3, you're flexible, not revealing your cards yet, what you're going to do with your minor pieces. And after a6, uh, e6, pardon me, White played here the move a4. Remarkable idea, grabbing space on the queen side, making another pawn move. So many pawn moves are played so far, but it's uh, it's actually making sense and it has been seen in uh, in earlier games. So one of the ideas is that later on uh, the queen may get a bit in uh, some sort of trouble, but we will see. C5 is uh, played here to, uh, to challenge the center. It's one of the principled ways of looking for counterplay, to challenge the center, but here, White captures on c5. And of course, if you do take back with the bishop, there is the move b4 and you're losing a piece because of this double attack. So you've got to take with the queen. Now knight f3 is played. And okay, black has to figure out how he is going to complete its uh, development on the king's side. But before doing that, Magnus says, I want to place my queen on a stable square. He places the queen on c7 so it can no longer be harassed by any of uh, white's minor pieces. And here... We are out of the theory. Both players, they have to come up with their own plans. Rapport decides to develop the knight to a3. So the plan is to get the knight to b5 from where it can hit the, the queen on c7. And well, the, the, the logical move would be to play a6. But there's also something to say for the idea of trading off your undeveloped bishop from f8 for the knight. So then white recaptures with the, the rook. And you can now easier uh, continue developing. So, for instance, moves like uh, knight e7, they are no longer obstructing the bishop on f8. So knight d7 is played, castling kingside, and here the knight gets out to, to e7. So white goes uh, rook to, uh, to e1, overprotecting uh, the pawn on uh, e5. And now after uh, rook c8, interesting decision by Rapport, as he goes here for the move queen d1. And you may think, why would you drop back with your queen? Well, it's just with the aim of discouraging black from castling kingside. As 
here one of the main drawbacks for black in this system with the moves h4 h5 included is that the pawn on h5 is quite vulnerable so for now the the king stays in the center so that the rook keeps this pawn defended first a6 is uh, played the bishop comes to uh, g5 so it puts pressure against the knight on e7 the knight goes to g6 and here by it now all of a sudden shifts the attention to the other side of the of the board and uh, it makes a lot of sense to fix the structure on the uh, queen side so in the long run this uh, pawn on uh, b7 and maybe a6 they, they can become vulnerable but for now everything is protected and the big question is actually what happens if you just take that pawn on e5 which was not played in the game but it's quite relevant if you do take on e5 your pawn up but maybe not for long the bishop comes to f4 pins the knight on e5 if it goes the way the queen on c7 will be hanging while if you do protect with f6 then i assume that the idea here for white is to play rook to b3 with massive pressure against the pawn on b7 the rook can also come to b6 to hit the pawn on e6 there's pressure on the e file on this diagonal and still here you see this queen on d1 is doing a great job because black cannot really castle uh, uh, kingside here as it will drop the pawn on h5 so i think that pawn on e5 it's um, if you take it it just improves white's uh, pieces so therefore black instead of uh, taking the pawn he decides now to castle immediately but okay the knight on f3 is still there so white is unable to to take it yet but the move rook a4 is played so the rook is looking for opportunities to reach the king side at uh, at some point and well here this pawn can be taken on e5 was not uh, done so but then at the end um at least the pawn on h5 can be taken and it's still complicated position it's not really bad but practically speaking i would not feel comfortable here as uh, black as i see that at some point the rook may come over uh, the, the knight on e5 can be hit all white pieces are looking great so i definitely uh, like uh, white's uh, practical chances here but anyway magnus didn't capture the pawn rook c e8 was uh, was played and uh, i think the idea is to uh, prepare maybe at some point moves like f6 trying to uh, challenge the center and then the rook on e8 supports indirectly the pawn on e6 the rook on f8 will support the pawn on f6 complicated uh, line in any case rook d4 is played to, to be honest i thought this was a remarkable idea i was expecting maybe the rook to come to b4 so that if you ever take on a5 well the um, pawn on b7 can be taken with a rook on d4 you're inviting black to take on a5 which was uh, not played and i'm actually wondering what the the exact plan is um probably the idea was to go for something like c4 with idea of opening up the center challenging the pawn on d5 which cannot be uh, moved away because it hangs the knight on d7 but it's very complex i i don't dare to take a side here i feel like it can go either way uh here so not sure why magnus didn't uh, play this move he felt okay i can take the pawn on e5 now and after knight takes e5 knight takes e5 okay the pawn on h5 can be taken but before doing that rapport played here to move bishop f4 we have seen this idea already earlier you're pinning the knight on e5 black has to protect the knight with the move uh, f6 and now queen takes h5 is played with a plan of taking on e5 and white is attacking that knight on uh, e5 not less than three times so if you can take twice on e5 you're winning a pawn but magnus his plan was now to play the move queen f7 to get out of the pin offering the exchange of queens so queens are coming off the board and of course black has to take back with a knight to avoid white from capturing on e5 and win a pawn so now you're threatening to play the move e5 we have a queenless middle game with uh, two rooks and a minor piece uh, each and uh, in balance in pawn structure potentially black spawns they they can become uh, quite strong if you can advance the pawn to e5 uh, you're about to to win material so white gotta do something about that and the logical move here would be to to move the rook away from d4 maybe to b4 or maybe back to d1 when you keep the rooks on the d and e file you see that it's harder for black to to make progress in the center 
But Rappert went for the move bishop h2. I understand. It's with the same aim of avoiding that double attack. But honestly, this bishop doesn't look too great being placed far away. It's not hitting anything on, uh, on this diagonal. So Magnus seems to be all right in this uh, position. And it's a kind of position he could play on forever, trying to uh, grind out a, a win against uh, weaker players. That's his trademark uh, style. So he goes for king h7. White goes for g4, trying to uh, grab space and seize the initiative on the king side. And now, interesting move, knight d8. So the knight is on its way to c6 to hit the rook on d4 and the pawn on a5. Bishop comes in now to d6, hits the rook on f8. And of course, you cannot move the rook to f7 because it runs into rook takes d5, exploiting the pawn on e6, which is uh, pinned. If you do take on d5, the rook on e8 is going to be taken and white will be a pawn up. So the rook goes to g8. Doesn't look great, but no problem whatsoever. Rook b4. Attacking the pawn, but okay, the knight still defends the pawn, so no immediate threat. But look, the knight comes out to c6 to hit the rook. Rook takes b7, knight takes a5. Material is still even. The rook goes to d7 to uh, protect the bishop because the knight is on its way to c4. Hitting the bishop, but okay, it's defended. You also hit the pawn on uh, b2. b3 is played. And now, obviously, you don't want to take on d6, because if the rook takes d6, both the pawns on the 6th rank come under threat by the rook. So instead, knight d2 is played. So now, quite some nice little tactics are uh, seen in this uh, position. So, big threat here is knight f3 with a knight fork. Black is about to win the exchange. You could move your king just up to, uh, to g2. Looks like a safe idea. But here, the rook goes to e2, hitting that knight on uh, d2, knight takes b3 played, and here bishop e7 with multiple threats, including bishop takes f6, attacking uh, uh, the king because, uh, well, the, the pawn on g7 is pinned. You're also threatening rook takes e6, but look at this, king h6, beautiful idea. And now the pawn on e6, it can actually not be taken here because it runs into the move knight c5, another knight fork. You're getting crazy with all these knight forks. And know that the bishop can't take the knight as it hangs the rook on e6. So white played here king f1. Not really sure what the king is planning to do. At least the rook is protected now. But it also gives black the opportunity to march forward with its central pawn. e5 is played. Rook takes d5. It's not an issue because it hangs the bishop. So here first rook to b2 played. Attacking. The um, knight on b3, the knight goes back to a5, and the rook comes in to b6 to hit the pawn on a6, but the knight comes in to c4 to attack this rook. And, uh, well, the rook captures the pawn, very, very understandable. But now it's rook a8. Black is trying to become active and is even willing to give up the pawn on d5, because after the exchange of, pawn, uh, exchange of rooks, rook takes a8, rook takes a8, the pawn on d5 can be taken because there is no longer a rook on uh, e8 to attack this bishop on e7. So all of a sudden, white is a pawn up. But in this endgame, the black knight is looking fantastic. It's quite, uh, quite a powerful piece. And after rook a2, bishop c5 is, uh, is played. And well, I, I think... A lot of things can, can still happen in this endgame. I mean, you can just make a random king move. And I really doubt white is able to utilize its, uh, its extra pawn on the C file. It's perfectly in control. Magnus felt, okay, I can just play rook C2 here. It's a mistake. First serious mistake of the game. But Rapport didn't uh, take advantage of it. He could have played here this move, rook D7, ignoring the pawn on C3. Because if you do take... You give up that weak pawn for the pawn on g7. The rook and bishop are piling up on this pawn on g7. So next move, you're going to take it. Uh, probably with check. The king is in trouble. You even have an, uh, an outside uh, past h pawn. It's very tricky for black. But instead, Rapport wanted to save the pawn. He played here rook d3. And here the big moment of the game, guys. Magnus is falling asleep. It's something which can happen to everyone. Because it's a relatively quiet position. But he found the worst move in the position. The only move which loses. 
as he played here the move knight e2 check with the idea that probably after the king goes away the knight comes to e4 you're hitting the bishop you're hitting the pawn on c3 and the the pawn on f2 what can go wrong overlooking the forcing move rook takes knight and black resigned because he's losing a piece if you take back well there is bishop to e3 with a double attack so this is just a huge blunder by world's number one something you normally may see in online chess but not in rapid games especially not in games with a time control of 45 minutes i mean magnus was down to about 15 seconds i think and you get an increment of 10 seconds per move so it's a very unusual blunder for somebody of magnus his caliber what should he have done instead well basically every move is uh, is still playable if um if you just play for instance something like e4 looks like a very nice logical forcing move to attack the rook if the rook goes away you can take on c3 and um i think there are no no problems here at uh, at all i mean if you take the pawn on e4 it's knight e2 once again there's a huge knight fork and uh, black wins the rook so better is something like uh, bishop b4 to hit the rook then the rook goes away you can take the pawn now but there's knight e2 again it's this knight fork but at least the bishop can trade itself for the knight and we have a three versus two on one wing which is a dead draw at um, at these players uh, their their level so knight e2 is just an absolutely shocking blunder and is this a typical magnus blunder it's just a bad start we know that magnus usually has very bad starts in uh, in tournaments so yeah let's see what he is um, if he's able to bounce back in the next few uh, games i'm curious to see What's going to happen? Let me know in the comments. What do you think of this game? Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Give it a like. Spread it. Uh, spread this video to all your friends. And make sure to come back to the channel as I will cover many more exciting games from this uh, new classical uh, tournament. The Grenka Chess Classic. I mean, it was actually taking place before pandemic. Now it's back with a new time control, new format. Very exciting. You see this blunder is... Uh, it's kind of a positive thing for uh, to see some dramatic chess in the next couple of uh, days. So stay tuned and we will see each other very soon again. Bye bye.